Hi, this is Kendall Boyson, professional life and recovery coach, and you're listening to Encouragementology, the practice of instilling hope. Hi there. Thanks for joining me. On this show, we're going to take a step back as we attempt to look at the bigger picture, find the irony, celebrate the unexpected benefits, and learn from the unintended consequences. Oh, hindsight, you're a beautiful thing with horrible timing. And good intentions? Well, you're just that. No judgment here, though. Our continued quest for self-discovery is all about learning from our successes and our failures. So many times we can't see the forest through all the trees. We make a reactive decision trying to solve an immediate problem only to create a bigger and more far-reaching issue. So what's the solution? Is there a cure for this infirmity? Oh boy, that would be Nobel Prize worthy since unintended consequences have been happening since the beginning of man. My intention here is to use this topic to broaden our views beyond thinking of people in power attempting to create policy that helps instead of hurts. I want us to think about our own thought processes. How many angles do we consider? How many opposing opinions or ideas? Who all and what all do we consider before making a decision? I think we can all safely say we've had tunnel vision at least one point or another in our lifetimes. Oh, and mix in this idea that we already know it all equals lots of decisions without fully thinking them through. I mean, you only know what you know, right? Unfortunately, you can only use that excuse for so long. At some point, you have to want to know more about yourself, the world around you, and what your impact is and can be. So to avoid unintended consequences, we're going to look at this topic from a number of angles. What is it? Our protection bubble, good and bad. Causes, reasons, and motivations. Why it's important to embrace opposing views and how to increase our critical thinking. Sound fun? Well, let's get started with a few unintended consequences. And now, great moments and unintended consequences. Part 1. The Money Train. The year? 1862. The problem? Well, okay, yeah, sure, but the other problem? There's no railroad connecting coastal elites. The solution? Pay rail companies for each mile of track laid for a brand new transcontinental railroad. Sounds like a great idea. With the best of intentions, what could possibly go wrong? While Congress has never been great at keeping an eye on spending, it's even worse during a civil war. With no one looking, the Union Pacific unnecessarily lengthened their route, adding miles of track and pocketing almost half a million dollars. After two and a half years of construction, the Union Pacific laid track all the way from Omaha to 40 miles outside of Omaha. I choo choo choose to screw taxpayers. Part 2. Burning Cash. The year? 2012. The problem? An over-reliance on fossil fuels in Northern Ireland. The solution? A subsidy for heat generated from renewable sources. Sounds like a great idea, with the best of intentions. What could possibly go wrong? Well, it turns out that the rate paid by the subsidy was greater than the cost of the fuel being used. So the more wood pellets you burn, the greater your profit. Voila! The Cash for Ash program, with farmers heating empty buildings just to collect a paycheck. The resulting fallout included Northern Ireland's First Minister refusing to stand aside during any inquiry, the Deputy First Minister resigning in protest, the dissolution of the Northern Ireland Assembly, and the collapse of the Executive Branch for almost three full years. Not to mention a whole lot of taxpayer dollars up in smoke. Part 3. Alright, fine, we'll do the Cobra thing. The year? Sometime in the 19th century, maybe, not sure. Might not actually be true, who knows. The problem? The English colonial city of Delhi is infested with venomous cobras. The solution? Give money to anyone who brings in a dead cobra. Sounds like a great idea, with the best of intentions. What could possibly go wrong? 
It didn't take long for folks to realize that the bounty paid for a dead cobra was greater than the cost of raising a cobra. Once city officials got wind of lucrative snake breeding farms, they repealed the bounty, leaving cobra farmers to release their now worthless snakes into the wild. Net result? More cobras than ever, a lot of wasted cash, and a book by some German guy with a title that sounds straight out of G.I. Joe. While the veracity of the cobra story is hard to pin down, there was a documented problem in Hanoi under French colonial rule, only this time the issue was rats, with a bounty paid for every rat tail brought to authorities. It wasn't long before colonial officials began to notice rats without tails, having been set free by rat catchers with a basic understanding of economics. But don't worry, we learned our lesson and it never happened again. Fort Benning, Georgia, where the feral pig population was out of control. The bounty, for some forehead slapping reason, was pigtails, which once again, blah, 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 more pigs. They eventually discontinued the bounty, so don't worry, everything's swine now. Great moments and unintended consequences. Good intentions, bad results. Over at Fraser Institute, I found our jumping off point. Unintended Consequences, How Regulation Influences Behavior by Christopher J. Cohn. Unintended consequences are the results of an action that differ from the expected outcome. As the name implies, these consequences are not the intended outcome of the action taken. Unintended consequences can be either positive or negative. A positive unintended consequence is an unanticipated benefit that emerges from an action. Adam Smith's notation of the invisible hand is one example of a positive unintended consequence. Smith famously argued that each individual pursuing his own ends generates widespread benefit beyond that individual. For example, the butcher doesn't provide beef out of benevolence but in order to make a profit. However, in pursuing his own interests, the butcher generates unintended benefits for numerous customers who now have access to his product. Given the positive unintended consequences often emerge from individuals' actions, emphasis should be placed on allowing individuals the freedom to act and interact. As individuals discover and pursue opportunities to better their own situation, they will also inadvertently contribute to improving the well-being of others. This process can only take place within an environment characterized by private property and individual freedom, where individuals have an incentive to experiment and act entrepreneurially. Unintended consequences can also be negative, as we just learned. Negative unintended consequences often emerge when a simple regulation is imposed on a complex system. Regulations are relatively simple because regulators cannot possess all of the relevant knowledge regarding the workings of the complex institutions that underpin economic and social interaction. Basically, they don't have all the facts. Because of their simplicity, regulations often change the incentives individuals face, resulting in unforeseen consequences. For instance, seatbelt laws. Economist Sam Peltzman analyzed the effects of mandatory seatbelt laws in the United States. Regulators believed that requiring drivers to wear seatbelts would reduce the number of automobile-related fatalities. Surprisingly, Peltzman found that there was no change in automobile-related deaths. The reason was the seatbelt laws changed the incentives drivers faced. The perceived safety provided by the seatbelt reduced the cost of driving recklessly, so more drivers operated their vehicles in a dangerous manner. The increase in reckless driving not only increased the danger for other drivers, but also for pedestrians and cyclists. Indeed, there was an increase in pedestrian and cyclist deaths after the seatbelt law was passed. Overall, Peltzman found that while seatbelts might have saved lives in a given accident, the total number of automobile-related fatalities did not change. This finding is known as the Peltzman effect. The tendency of individuals to respond to safety regulations by engaging in more dangerous behavior. An explanation for this tendency is that people have a desired level of risk when it comes to driving. 
and will change their behavior as regulations change. Remember the gift of the Magi? I'll never forget that story. On Christmas Eve, Della Young discovers that she only has $1.87 to buy a present for her husband, Jim. She visits the nearby shop of a hairdresser, Madame Sofroni, who buys Della's long hair for $20. Della then uses the money to buy a platinum pocket watch for Jim. When Jim comes home from work that evening, Della admits to him that she sold her hair to buy him the chain. Jim gives Della her present, a set of ornamental combs, which she will be unable to use until her hair grows back out. Della gives Jim the watch chain, and he tells her that he sold the watch to buy the combs. While the gifts that Jim and Della gave each other cannot be used, they know how far each one of them went to show their love. Now, they both have the best intentions and hopefully a good return policy. Even though, in that instance, no harm, no foul, what have you set out to do with your best intentions only to have it blow up, good or bad. I want to tell you about a positive, unintended consequence of my own. Five years ago, I created a job-seeking workshop for women. I was feeling compelled and led to start giving back and contributing. I have been a professional most of my life, and I thought this would be something super valuable. The day was filled with many breakout sessions, building resumes, finding job interests, interview skills, makeovers, new clothes from our job-seeking workshop closet. It was a success. But it was after the event and on the way home that I got the biggest revelation. It wasn't about the material benefits, the resume, the makeover, the clothes, or even the lunch. It was about the encouragement. Speaking life into someone else. A woman thanked me for making her feel so good about herself, and it changed my world. The mission of spreading encouragement began right then. Now, one person can't do it alone, so the movement became teaching others how easily they could encourage the people they encounter. Encouragementology was a positive, unintended consequence that I am so, so very thankful for. But, you ready for some more blunders? Could these really make you think? And now, Great Moments in Unintended Consequences. Part 1, Driving Days. The year, 1989. The problem, terrible air quality in Mexico City. The solution, prohibit one out of five cars from driving each weekday based on their license plate numbers to keep traffic down and improve air quality. Sounds like a great idea. With the best of intentions, what could possibly go wrong? Citizens got around the ban by buying a second car, often cheaper, older, and less efficient. Having more, crappier cars in circulation failed to fix the problem, and according to a number of studies, air pollution actually increased after the restrictions were imposed. But not to worry, politicians saw the error of their ways and in 2008, expanded the program to Saturdays. Yes, really. Part 2. Boat Taxes The year, 1773. The problem? Britain needs money. The solution? Collect port and lighthouse fees on merchant ships based on their length and width. Sounds like a great idea. With the best of intentions, what could possibly go wrong? Shockingly for the British, people don't like paying taxes. Since ships were charged by width and length but not depth, shipbuilders maximize cargo capacity while minimizing taxes by building deep, sluggish, flat-bottom, flat-sided vessels. A recipe for instability. So while Britain's navy was ruling the seas, their unsightly and unmanageable merchant ships were a laughingstock. But on the plus side, the tax man can't reach you on the bottom of the ocean. Part 3. Flying the Empty Skies. The year, 2020. The problem? A global pandemic straining the American airline industry. The solution? A $60 billion bailout to rescue airlines and maintain continuity of service. Sounds like a great idea. With the best of intentions, what could possibly go wrong? With concerns over COVID, air passenger rates plummeted as much as 95%. But since airlines were mandated to maintain a minimum level of service to qualify for the emergency government funding, airlines were forced to continue flying planes, even if there was no one on board. 
voila! American skies were quickly filled with ghost flights, nearly empty planes crisscrossing the country so the industry could qualify for billions of taxpayer funds. Jet fuel wasn't the only thing being wasted. Great moments and unintended consequences. Good intentions, bad results. Okay, while you're still laughing, I really want to think about our own thought process too and where we learn, how we kind of grow and expand. Roger Dean Duncan gives us some inspiration with Escape the Bubble and Learn from Opposing Views found at Forbes.com. Most of us cling to our personal opinions like Velcro. In fact, we prefer reinforcement from like-minded friends and commentators. The problem with that kind of echo chamber is that we miss the opportunity to learn. I'm not suggesting that we abandon our own values or opinions. What I'm saying is that opposing views can be surprisingly informative and they can enrich our own understanding of issues that are important to us. That's the primary thesis of Love Your Enemies, How Decent People Can Save America from the Culture of Contempt, a terrific book by Arthur Brooks, president of the American Enterprise Institute. In previous parts of the conversation, Brooks said our society doesn't necessarily need less disagreement. We just need better disagreement. He offers a productive skill we can adopt from resources uh, from Nelson Mandela and a marriage counselor. Here is an interview transcribed. Roger Dean Duncan, Escape the Bubble is something you recommend. Please explain and tell us about the benefits of that. Arthur Brooks said, Many of us live in intellectual silos, friending and following only the people and sources we already agree with. While it's comforting to hear that you're right all of the time, it skews our perspectives in a dangerous way. First, by keeping our own ideas safe from any challenge, and second, by allowing perceptions of our political opponents to be shaped by caricatures of the people with whom we disagree, not the people themselves. In this way, we live in a dangerous unreality, which is why escaping the bubble is so important. What does escaping the bubble look like? If you read the New York Times, pick up the Wall Street Journal's op-ed page every now and then. If you only listen to conservative talk radio, try NPR's Morning Edition once a week. Or better yet, befriend someone who doesn't vote like you. When we escape the bubble, it humanizes those we would otherwise view and treat with contempt. Duncan asked, in terms of loving our enemies, what can we learn from Nelson Mandela? Brooks said, the key lesson to learn from Mandela and world historical leaders like him is that the best long-term strategy for victory is love. To be clear, love in this context is not a mushy and temporal sentiment, but something tough and bracing. To truly love others is to embody a radical commitment to the good of all people, even those who treat you with contempt and abuse. Mandela was beaten, imprisoned, and assigned to forced labor for years, but he possessed the fortitude to love and even befriend his captors. Love does not mean apathy or inaction. Mandela stood unwaveringly against the evils of apartheid. But as a leader, he understood that to respond in kind to those who hated him would only continue a vicious cycle of contempt. Our leaders would benefit greatly from emulating this example rather than continuing to wage a highly destructive ideological holy war. Duncan asked, What do you regard as the most helpful three or four rules for maintaining healthful relationships with people of opposing viewpoints? Brooks said, My first rule comes from the renowned psychologist and marriage counselor, John Gottman, who established what he calls the five-to-one rule. For every negative or critical thing you say about your partner, offer five positive and encouraging remarks. Adhering to this rule makes a world of difference when we talk to those with whom we disagree. 
The second rule is to not insult or assign ulterior motives to people who disagree with us. We all have unique stories that have brought us to our current beliefs, and by assuming the worst of others or directly insulting them, you will almost always preclude the possibility of persuading them to see an issue as you do. No one has ever been insulted into agreement. The third rule is to start with your why rather than your what. Most people who disagree talk about specific policy beliefs rather than the principles that motivate those policy beliefs. But by starting with your why, you can establish a common cause with those who might have a different what, but are willing to hear you out because they know you want to achieve the same things. It's the common why that allows us to disagree better with others rather than disagree less. Duncan asked, you equate thoughtful listening with missionary work. How can that analogy help someone exchange contempt for respect and even appreciation and love? Brooks said, when it comes to serious political disagreements, I'll often ask people what their goal is with respect to those on the other side of the issue. Do you want to exile them, jail them, silence them? Almost everyone says no, of course not. Most people say they just want their ideological opponents to think and behave differently. The goal of many missionaries. So how do you win people over? Not by pouring scorn on those who think differently, but by expressing your own values with love and kindness. This is what missionaries do, and it will make you a magnetic force for your side of an argument. So in addition to being the morally right thing to do, listening and responding in a spirit of love ends up being the most pragmatic way to bring people to your side. I've been accused of being in my own bubble, and I rather like it there. But the difference is I'm not building a protective barrier around my rigid ideas. I just choose to protect my mind from constant chaos. In my bubble, it's pretty peaceful, happy, and serene, so I have to be judicious about what I let penetrate that space. I am, however, completely open to opposing views. We're a country full of different cultures and different viewpoints. We built it that way. It would be unrealistic for us to have one opinion and one idea. So what then? You have a group of people that believe one thing and another group that believes another. But we all need each other. So we have to find a way to work it out, allowing everyone to feel supported, respected, and heard, even if we don't agree. Mark Golston and John Ullman give us how to really understand someone else's point of view. Found at the Harvard Business Review, the most influential people strive for genuine buy-in and commitment. They don't rely on compliance techniques that only secure short-term persuasion. That was our conclusion after interviewing over 100 highly respected influences across many different industries and organizations for our recent book. These high-impact influencers follow a pattern of four steps that all of us can put into action. Step one, go for great outcomes. Step two, listen past your blind spots. Step three, Engage others in their, their. And step four, when you've done enough, do more. To understand why step three is so important, imagine that you're at one end of a shopping mall, say the northeast corner by a cafe. Next, imagine that a friend of yours is at the opposite end of the mall next to the toy store. And imagine that you're telling that person how to get to where you are. Now picture yourself saying, to get to where I am, start in the northeast corner by a cafe. That doesn't make sense, does it? Because that's where you are, not where the other person is. Yet that's how we often try to convince others on our terms, from our assumptions, and based on our experiences. We present our case from our point of view. 
There's a communication chasm between us and them, but we're acting as if they're already on our side of the gap. Like the shopping mall example, we make a mistake by starting with how we see things, our here. To help the other person move, we need to start with how they see things, their, their. For real influence, we need to go from our here to their, their to engage others in three specific ways. Situational awareness. Show that you get it. Show that you understand the opportunities and challenges your conversational counterpart is facing. Offer ideas that work in the person's there. When you've grasped their reality in a way that rings true, you'll hear comments like, you really get it, or you actually understand what I'm dealing with here. Personal awareness. You get them. Show that you understand his or her strengths, weaknesses, goals, hopes, priorities, needs, limitations, fears, and concerns. In addition, you demonstrate that you're willing to connect with them on a personal level. When you do this right, you'll hear people say things like, you really get me. You actually understand where I'm coming from on this. Solution awareness. Get their path to progress. Show people a positive path that enables them to make progress on their own terms. Give them options and alternatives that empower them. Based on your understanding of their situation and what's at stake for them personally, offer possibilities for making things better and help them think more clearly, feel better, and act smarter. When you succeed, you'll hear comments like, that could really work, or I see how that could help me. One of our favorite examples involves Mike Critelli, former CEO of the extraordinary successful company Pitney Bowes. Mike was one of the highly prestigious good to great CEOs featured in the seminal book by Jim Collins on how the most successful businesses achieve their results. One of Mike's many strengths is the ability to engage his team on their terms to achieve high levels of performance and motivation. When we asked him about this, he said, very often what motivates people are the little gestures and a leader needs to listen for those. It's about picking up on other things that are most meaningful to people. For example, one employee had a passing conversation with Mike about the challenges of adopting a child, pointing out that Pitney Bowes had an inadequate adoption benefit. A few weeks after that, he and his wife received a letter from Mike congratulating them on their new child, along with a check for the amount of the new adoption benefit the company had just started offering. When he retired, the Pitney Bowes employees put together a video in which they expressed their appreciation for his positive influences over the years. They all talk about ways that Mike got them. Personal connections and actions that have accumulated over time into a reputation that attracted great people to the organization and motivated them to stay. It's a moving set of testimonials and it's telling about Critelli's ability to get people on their own terms, to go to their, their, that they openly express their appreciation permanently captured on a video for open public viewing. Remember, they did this after he was no longer in power. Like Mike Critelli does, when you practice all three of these ways of getting others, situational, personal, and solution-oriented, you understand who people are, what they're facing, and what they need in order to move forward. This is a powerful way to achieve great results while strengthening your relationships. When you're trying to influence, don't start by trying to pull others into your here. Instead, go to their there by asking yourself, am I getting who this person is? Am I getting this person's situation? Am I offering options and alternatives that will help this person move forward? Does this person get that I get it? Encouragementology is all about Connect, understand, and encourage. And in order to understand, you have to be open and ready to listen. To offer empathetic statements of support. I understand what you're saying. 
I hear you. Sometimes it's just a matter of people being heard. It doesn't mean that you have to agree with them, but you're willing to listen. Ready for a few more unintended consequences? And now, Great Moments and Unintended Consequences. Part 1. Roadkill. The year? 2012. The problem? Driving fatalities on Texas roads. The solution? Implement a simple, cost-effective awareness campaign by displaying crash death totals on highway message boards. Sounds like a great idea. With the best of intentions, what could possibly go wrong? In order to read these messages, passing motorists must look away from the road. Accidents along roads with new displays increased by 4.5% within 10 kilometers of the sign, according to one study, amounting to an additional 2,600 crashes and 16 deaths per year in Texas. Not good news, considering more than half of states in the nation have deployed these signs on their... Oh, what's that over there? Part 2. Bottle Throttle the year? 2013. The problem? Bottled water consumption at the University of Vermont is creating too much waste. The solution? Eliminate water bottles from campus vending machines, hand out reusable containers, and spend a hundred grand to add filling stations around campus. Sounds like a great idea. With the best of intentions, what could possibly go wrong? Students don't always remember things, like their reusable water bottles. Faced with limited choices, a study revealed the demand for sugary drinks on campus surged 25%, and plastic bottle use per capita increased 6%. Some ideas should not be recycled. Part 3. No way, fiancé. The year? 1900. The problem? Argentinian bachelors sucking up valuable resources without producing more citizens. The solution? A bachelor tax, a strangely popular feature of the time, but with a special waiver for those gentlemen whose proposals were turned down. No need to pour salt in that wound come tax day. Sounds like a bizarrely antiquated idea. With the best of intentions, what could possibly go wrong? The tax exemption gave rise to an entirely new vocation, professional rejectors. These entrepreneurial ladies would swear to authorities that a gentleman tried and failed to win their hand, all for a fraction of the cost of the tax itself. Proving the old adage, you can't buy love, but rejection is on sale. This has been Great Moments and Unintended Consequences. Good intentions, bad results. I wonder if this is where give an inch, take a mile comes from? <laughs> I'm not sure. Joe B. Carnival asks, are you open to opposing viewpoints? Three tips for improving critical thinking. The ability to change one's mind when confronted with new evidence or information, or better yet, the willingness to actively seek out opposing viewpoints is an important quality needed to be successful in both business and and in life. It's crucial for leaders who want to ensure their organization remains innovative and necessary for society to function optimally. All too often, we become insulted from information that runs counter to our existing beliefs. Breaking this type of thinking should be a priority for anyone interested in enhancing their critical thinking skills. After all, when you insulate yourself from opposing viewpoints, you're potentially depriving yourself of information needed to make a more informed decision. Toward that end, here are a few strategies you can begin incorporating right away that can help you become more open to opposing viewpoints and enhance your ability to think critically. Number one, be willing to question your current view of reality. Take a moment to reflect on some of your most deeply held beliefs and opinions. As you do this, try to be intentionally broad, accounting for the full spectrum of social, political, and organizational issues that comprise your current view of reality. A critical step toward becoming more open to opposing viewpoints requires a sense of humility, which constitutes a willingness to learn from others and an acknowledgement of your own limitations. Luckily, this is a quality that can be developed and nurtured through practice. Number two, regularly seek out counter information. 
Simply recognizing your own fallibility while necessary is not a sufficient condition for becoming more open and tolerant to opposing viewpoints. It's all too easy to get into the habit of narrowly focusing our attention on information that aligns with our pre-existing views. Overcoming such tendencies can be exceptionally difficult, especially when the beliefs and opinions we hold are highly entrenched or become tied to our identity. Given the mental discomfort that can arise when we encounter information contrary to our current views, a willingness to seek out alternative perspectives takes a conscious effort. Doing this will undoubtedly identify blind spots in your own thinking and may even strengthen your own convictions by understanding not only the best and most convincing arguments for your position, but also those against it. Number three, become aware of how you feel in the moment. Even with the best intentions to remain receptive to opposing viewpoints, putting this mindset into practice can be exceptionally challenging. It's important to remain mindful of these processes and to regularly monitor how you feel in the moment to ensure your judgment of the opposing evidence is based on reason and not on unbridled emotion. There is value in exposing yourself to arguments that run counter to your current perspective. To reap the benefits, be sure to acknowledge your own failability. Seek out opposing information and remain mindful of your emotions when evaluating the evidence. Remember I said, you only know what you know. Always be willing to question that because you're evolving and growing and becoming someone new every day. Don't rely on information to come to you. Seek out knowledge. Our best teachers are right around us. The man who delivers your mail, the elderly lady who lives next door, the neighbors that walk their dog, the coworker who just started on Monday. Your life is full of teachers and you're one as well. If you want to share Encouragementology with a friend who needs to know they're not alone in this journey of self-discovery, you can visit Encouragementology.com or anywhere you stream your content to receive this episode and all others. Follow us on Facebook for additional encouragement throughout the week. So I challenge you, test your solution from every angle to see how others might be impacted. Embrace the positives and learn from the negatives to course correct any unintended circumstances. I know you can do it. Thank you for listening to Encouragementology with Kendall Boyson, where we find positive ways to handle some of life's challenges. I stumbled through until the path was clear.